Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 19. The Screwtape Letters, Letter 11. I love to laugh. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where Matt, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon, Screwtape, as he explains how to tempt the patient, a human assigned to his nephew, a demon named Wormwood. Each week we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting Screwtape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. And today we have not one, but two guest co-hosts. David Niles and Adam Minahan, lifelong friends and co-hosts of The Catholic Man Show. Adam and David, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thank you for having us. Always feel honored to be on your show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the first time, but I'm, I'm glad that you always feel it's, honored. That was, it's 100% of the time. 100% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to know, uh, Mr. Bates, that I, um, at dinner, I, was a, I adopted the Continental style in anticipation of being on your show today. I just want you to know that. And what do you mean by adopting the Continental style? I'm a little scared. Well, I ate, I ate dinner in the Continental, you know, like fork in left hand, upside down, <laughs> knife in right hand. Or no, no, no. So you had table manners, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did that too. But I did it. <laughs> I did that just for the show today. Nice. Yeah. I wore a top hat and had a, a cane that I was walking around with all did day you? today. Yeah. Did you? For prepping this. I yeah. find that the children are more afraid of me when I have a cane. <laughs> I don't know why. That's. I don't know yeah, why. Fair enough. And rightly so. <laughs> Well, the last time I had two guest co-hosts on the show, I actually had them introduce each other. And since it's quirky and fun and far less work for me, I thought we would do it again. So, Adam, who is David Niles? Okay, so David Niles is a man striving for virtue who is a cradle Catholic, who is a, uh, a husband to a, a wonderful bride, Pamela, and a father to three beautiful girls, and a... Little baby boy, baby Davy. Uh, he enjoys bacon. And he enjoys scotch and cigars Me- in moderation. Medium length walks. And medium length walks on the beach because no one really likes long walks. No one likes a short yeah. walk. You, yeah. you enjoy just a medium walk on the beach. Right. Uh, David has been active in the church for, I don't know, at least since 2013 as far as from his reversion. Mm-hmm. President of St. Michael Catholic Radio, a financial advisor, and I think that's that, that sums you up in a pretty good nu- nutshell. That is a much better introduction than I was really prepared to give you, um, so I'm going to have to really up my game. Adam uh, Adam and I, we have been friends, as you said, since around since about kindergarten. Our, uh, our paths mainly are very similar. Um, we both kind of fell away from the church and college, and so it was really together we were we were roommates after college we kind of encouraged each other coming back to the faith so um it's been a real pleasure being his friend just because i I don't think that i would be where i am in the church right now without him adam is the husband of his beautiful bride Haley. they have four children three two boys a girl and then another boy he is a salesman by trade he's also the ceo of saint michael radio here in lovely tulsa oklahoma um, he enjoys hunting, scotch, hats, um, and a nice tennis shoe. <laughs> also cigars, and I, I presume medium length walks on the beach. I mean, like, yeah, I wouldn't want a depends long. Depends on one. the company, yeah. really. You know, depends on the company. And are we talking Pacific or Atlantic? People just like act as if all beaches are the same. It's that's ridiculous. Not, that's not true. It's totally ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that that is that's the essence of Adam Minahan. I think you have both distilled the essence of each other very beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, it's a uh, pretty high ABV, that distillization, but um, yeah, that's it right there. You're looking at it. Now, I first came across you guys while I was walking the Camino de Santiago. Uh, you guys had just launched your podcast, I think only a couple of episodes in, and this podcast is The Catholic Man Show. And so I got to listen to a couple of episodes of that while I was walking across Spain. So I'd like you to give the people listening a quick pitch for your podcast and describe what typically happens in a show. Okay, I'll let you do that, Dave, but I I just have to apologize to Mr. Bates really fast. 
because Mr. Bates, you were one of the first people that we realized outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, were listening to our podcast. <laughs> Probably like the top, like top five. Or like I think the first five, maybe. maybe the second. Yeah, yeah, at least for sure the top, in the first five. And we were so shocked that somebody else was outside of Tulsa was listening to us. And I was so excited that somebody was, and I wanted to give a shout out to, to you. And I called you by the wrong name. And that's how terrible we were at our show. What did you call him? I don't rem- I don't even remember. Do you remember, David? Was it Steve, maybe? I don't know. Steve. Maybe. That, it was Steve. It yeah. was nothing even remotely It was not close. even close. I mean, There's a guy named Steve. And he's- <laughs> but you, you can relate to this. There's times on a podcast where you, you want to do something and you're planning on doing it, but you never you didn't do like enough prep work. And then you start talking about it and you realize halfway in the middle of their sentence, you realize, oh, I'm drawing a blank on this guy's name. And you just kind of have to roll with it. You just kind of have to, I hope yeah. this is the case, you know. Yeah. And anyway, so we gave you a shout out. And it was clearly you because we, were, we said. The Restless you know, Pilgrim. The, the, the Restless Pilgrim. And then we also said, you know, you're, you're doing the El Camino. Cheers to you and all this stuff. So there's no his, no his, backing out. His name is Steve. And his name is Steve. <laughs> Shout out to Steve. So I don't know if I've ever apologized about that to you or not, but... See, I just looked at it as a bonus because not only did I get an initial shout out, I then got a subsequent correction. Yeah. Yeah, you got a twofer. You definitely got yeah. a twofer. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Okay, so on the Catholic Man Show, every episode we do three things. First, we open, review, and enjoy a manly beverage. So we start drinking... Um, a lot of people, especially old ladies, if I tell an old lady about our show, I, sometimes I worry that they're a little scandalized, but, um, you know, there's something about having a drink that enhances the conversation if done the right way. You know, if you're having a good drink, you know, you're not drinking just to drink, but you're drinking for, you know, the beauty and the, the leisure of the whole thing. Um, God made the things of this earth good, and we should enjoy them for their goodness. So uh, it also gives us the opportunity to talk about the virtue of temperance and moderation. The second thing we do is we highlight a man gear of some kind. Uh, this just be anything, any dude stuff. You know, flamethrowers to chainsaws, pocket knives, rosaries, Bibles, you, you know, you name it. And there's no hyperbole here. You have had all of those as man gears. Yes. Yes. Yeah, li- yes, literally yes. all of them. Yes. In fact, I think we've done a flamethrower twice. If you count the flamethrower proper and the, the grill, grill gun. and the grill gun, sure. I have never used the term flamethrower proper until right there, and I it felt good. I will tell you that it felt it did. It felt right. I think that was because you ate in the continental style. I think right? so, and it did feel British of me. I felt like like that was I. That's what that's how the Brits would say it: the flamethrower proper. Anyway, um, we use the man gear as a, an opportunity to highlight virtue again. Uh, because if you can say that these things are manly, um, then you know what is it about them that's manly? There's some manly virtue that they exemplify. And so by thinking about that, even if we don't directly approach it that way, it still is a, a way of reflecting on manhood itself and just what it is, what it means, what it looks like in the real world. So then finally we have a topic. And really the, the overarching theme of our show is just to promote this idea of uh, returning to virtuous living within the man. You know, just... The idea, even the concept of men pursuing virtue as a power of masculinity has just altogether disappeared, I think, from the goals of culture. You know, it's, it's not something that I think men are even aware of most of the time. Um, so we want to promote this idea of if you want to be manly, you need to pursue virtue in your own life. So that's the Catholic Man Show. And over the time that I've known you guys, I've actually gone camping with you twice in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. nearly been washed away both times. <laughs> uh, and I've come to talk on your show. Uh, once we did a live stream about the early church, and I've been on a couple of episodes talking about my guy, C.S. Lewis. So it is lovely, really, really lovely to be able to return the favor and have you guys here on Pints for Jack. Yeah, thank, yeah I'm yeah. stoked e- about every it. Every time that I've been on, I've, been, I've, en- I've enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> every time. <laughs> And today we're going to be discussing letter 11 of the Screwtape Letters, which is a letter that you guys mentioned on an episode a couple of months ago. I think it was September. And since the subject of this letter is laughter and humor, uh, the episode title comes from a song from my favorite childhood movie, Mary Poppins. 
So the episode title is I Love to Laugh, which for those of you who haven't seen the movie, it's sung in a scene where the children have a tea party on the ceiling, which is the usual experience of most British children, just <laughs> FYI. They call that a Wednesday. Yeah. It's because of the single pair health system, I think. That's why. <laughs> Now, since we're talking about laughter today, what are some of your favorite comedy shows or movies? I, I think probably most people have got a sense of your sense of humor at this point, but just in case they needed any more warning, what are the sorts of things that make you laugh? I, I listen to The Office. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've listened to The Office, I can't tell you how many times. You watch The Office? I mean, you listen yeah, to I it listen too, to, Well, right? I actually listen to it more than I actually watch it because we, my wife and I listen to it before we go to bed. A lot of times we'll listen to it. We rarely actually watch it because we've we've watched it so you many times we already know what's happening you don't need to, visually yeah. uh and, but we but it just kind of gives us a, a, a you know makes us laugh and so we, i like the office i like Park, parks and rec yeah the office uh definitely is i think i quote seinfeld more than the office seinfeld's another one that i absolutely love you do both strike me as a fluffy shirt sort of guy <laughs> <laughs> how dare you sir no soup for you <laughs> come back in one year um, in fact, I was quoting Seinfeld today. I don't even remember what it was. It was going at it was at lunch. But um, so I, I go back and forth. I think recently I saw this article, and I just read the headline. You know, like because that's all you have so to you do. So you basically I mean, read I, it. I, you basically read the I article. Basically, tell you all about it. <laughs> right. It, just the other day, someone said, "I recently read this book." No, that's a lie. It, it was an article. Well, it was the title. Well, it was a video. Well, it was a clip. I watched some of a clip. <laughs> as it was, I watched enough of it as I was scrolling through Facebook. It starts to play as it keeps going. Like, that's how much of it I saw. But I got it. You know, that was enough. But uh, the, basically, the headline was saying that the science, science had determined that The Office was the funniest show of all time. I don't no know. No kidding? I mean, and once again, I didn't read the article, so I don't know what they did. But science, bro. Yeah. I mean, add, add it up. The thing is, it agrees with my preconceived opinions, and so therefore, it must be true. Yeah. But are you certain that they were referring to the U.S. version of The Office or the U.K. version? I have. I okay. have watched the. Uh, I have the U.K. The version as well. Yeah, and I, I, I appreciate the British version. I, I, I like, I, I like The Office, the British version. Uh, I enjoy. The U.S. version better only because there's more of it that, that you know, it goes deeper well, into the story. I mean, it's also tough because once you see one version and you, you know, like this is the one that you like. Right, right, right. You know, you're expecting it, the other one to be, and it's not the same. It's not the same. I right, agree. But it's so similar. No, I so I think if you saw the British first, you I might did, feel the same way. I did. I actually watched the British version first. Oh, did first. you? Oh, yes. no kidding. Yeah. And then you come to the U.S. version, you find that they've really innovated because in the English version... The character is called Tim, whereas in the U.S. version, he's called Jim. So they 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 really added something special with the U.S. version. Yeah, uh, we're we're pretty smart. Yeah, I mean it's like they took the T <laughs> and they just added a little hook at the bottom. Now I'm going to be relying on your expertise to get things going. Okay. And so since uh, you speak about virtue, I want you to demonstrate your virtue of hilaritas. It is a real virtue. I checked. I'm virtuous. Uh, and I since, am so virtuous. <laughs> and since you're both fathers, uh, I was hoping you could kick us off with a dad joke or two. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, why can your Why can your nose not be twelve inches long? I don't know. Because then it would be a foot. <laughs> okay, so that was the question I was going to ask you. Because when you when you refer to dad jokes. There's two different ways I I can see people know like, what a dad joke. Well, is, there's two different I ways I, I I I think about dad jokes. I think about dad jokes in, insofar as a dad telling a joke to the kids to make them laugh, and then a typical like one-liner pun dad joke uh, that you just keep going and going and going and mm -hmm. you know just try to just beat it to the to to death. Well, there's actually a very easy way of being able to tell something is a dad joke. It's because the pun is a parent. It's a parent, exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, and that's not a faux pas, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> that was good. So I'm reading this book about anti-gravity right now, and it is impossible to put down. <laughs> I would tell a, a joke about pizza, but it'd be way too cheesy. Yeah. Even, even if I loved it from my head tomato. Right. Well, I, I have a joke about ceilings, but it'll probably be over your heads. 
<laughs> no doubt. <laughs> uh, out of all the other ones that I looked up, this one was my favorite. What's the name of the world's worst lion tamer? Claude Bottom. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and now we've set the bar as low as humanly possible. <laughs> Let's get on. I think we've probably isolated and, and annihilated most of your listeners by now. I apologize, David. No, it, it's good. It's good. They needed to know what they were getting themselves into. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, fair play. So let's get on and do the quote of the week. And it comes from today's chapter. Screwtape writes, Among flippant people, the joke is always assumed to have been made. If prolonged, the habit of flippancy builds up around a man the finest armor plating against the enemy that I know. And we'll be unpacking that a little bit later while we are drinking the drink of the week. Would you guys mind telling the ladies and gentlemen what we are going to be drinking today? Sure, it's... Uh... Buchanan's Buc- Deluxe. Buchanan's Deluxe, twelve year blended Scotch whiskey. So uh, one interesting fact, one interesting thing about Buchanan's is that it is incredibly popular in South America. I heard the same thing. This is what they drink: it's Chivas and Buchanan's down there. And if you've never had Buchanan's, when you open it and you try to pour it, you might be befuddled. As first. I was. Yes, because I don't know why, but they put like this. A weird valve in it. You have to shake it to get it out. And then it'll start to pour. I, I think it was, it's just trying to promote moderation. Yeah. Because you can't get it out too quickly. It's a virtue stopper. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. But it really is pretty good. I, I, you know, this is one of those that I don't see many people drinking. How much was it? When you uh, over it? here in, in Oklahoma, it's 30, it was 35 bucks. Oh, really? So it's very, very reasonable. Oh, shoot. I don't know what it is over there in California land where you live, which, by the way, I'm trying to convince you and your wife to move to to Tulsa. It is it's the place to go for only really cool Catholics. Right. That that's <laughs> yeah, where you yeah, want to be. Actually, we're, we try to be careful when we promote Tulsa because we don't want too many people moving here. We really we just want the right people moving here. Like for the most part, I tell people like, oh, yeah, it's just flyover country. You you don't want to be over here. Like, if I'm just talking to, like, your average Californian, I'm going to be like, oh, you would hate it. Yeah. It's the worst. I would talk about tornadoes just, and things, like, things like that. Horse that, manure everywhere. Yeah. You know, uh, the TPs aren't air conditioned. Yeah. The it's horse and buggies take forever. Ridiculous. Yeah. But, David, we'd like, we would, we would enjoy you, you and your, your bride over here in Tulsa. Well, I have to come back at least once to go and pick up my suit, which is still sitting in your oh, closet. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you brought that up. So David, David left his suit over at my house. I remember that. two years ago, and for the last two years, Haley and I have been. Oh, we need to send that suit back. Oh, we need to send that suit back. And then we were going to send it back as a joke, as a wedding gift, <laughs> and that was actually going to be like kind of like ha ha ha. And then I in like I bought a wedding gift, and I was like oh. I ruined it. Now he's going to know that's not the gift. And then only delayed my, I pr- continued to procrastinate to send it to you. So yes, we still have it, Dave. It, it's great. It's hanging up in my, uh, my, looks real nice. My, uh, my baby boy's closet. Um, I'd love to send it to you. And someday. I also have your sleeping bag and camping chair. Yeah, but I donated those. That's okay. I tell people this is David Bates chair <laughs> when I sit in it. Yeah. One day, one day there will be relics. So I'm sorry about that, oh, David. The, so anyway, somehow we got. Oh, okay, uh, we're so, talking about this Buchanan uh, somehow. So what? What? What do you get? What do you get on the nose, David? Definitely mm. peaty. Yeah, a little bit of citrus. This is the part where you get to look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> they can't see us though, so that's. I know. Cool. I'm just saying that when you when you smell a whiskey, if yeah. someone sees you smelling a whiskey, they're gonna be like, "That guy, he knows what he's doing." Yeah, I always just try and do arithmetic in my head at the same time. It looks like I'm really mm. concentrating and discerning mm. something what special. Is the square root of eleven. Dude, I was uh. just about to say, like, use the what is a square root of a number as my example. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, on the palate, as uh, as it's, it's definitely quite caramelly. A mm-hmm. uh-huh. little bit of mm-hmm. vanilla. The peat is not there on the palate. No, it it's, it saves that for the finish. The finish has a little bit of peat, a little bit of oak, a little bit of smoke, but. The palate, actually, in my opinion, is more of the citrusy, the toffee, right. the caramel, the melted butter. You know, uh, this is not going to be the, if you have this, this definitely won't be the nicest scotch on your, in your bar. But for $35, I 
Well worth it. That it's not super complex, but for for the for the guys who are intro to scotch or maybe even intro to the the smoky smoky peatier scotches, this would be perfect to bring it out. Because I'm not listen. I, I like a lot of guys, but I'm not I'm not interested in breaking out the Lafroig lore or like Lafroig Lef- no. to guys who don't appreciate peat. Right. I'll I'll, I'll appreciate There's it. There's water in the fridge. Right. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a good. It's yeah, a good I, mean, I think like the flavor per dollar is high. Is high with this. Yeah. Now each episode we toast one of our gold level supporters on Patreon, and today we are toasting Alex Sweats. Uh, so Alex. May you always be free from flippancy and filled with joy. Cheers. 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 Each week I give a 100-word summary of today's letter, and this one was first published in The Guardian on the 11th of July in 1941. Hearing that the patient's worldly friends are great laughers, Screwtape describes four kinds of laughter. Joy is the kind of laughter which appears between friends reunited on the eve of a holiday. It must be avoided at all costs. Next, there is fun. Emotional froth arriving from the play instinct. It's not much use, except as a distraction. The next is the joke proper, which stems from the perception of incongruity. It can be used to destroy shame. Finally, there is flippancy, which is to be encouraged as it protects the patient from God like a suit of armor. So let's get stuck into today's letter. Listeners all recall that one was patient had recently made two new friends, and Screwtape was just overjoyed at this, uh, their being worldly and skeptical and superficially intellectual. And Screwtape's joy continues to flow in this letter because the patient's new acquaintances have introduced him to their whole circle of friends. And Screwtape notes with glee, all these, as I find from the record office, are thoroughly reliable people. Steady, consistent scoffers and worldlings who, without any spectacular crimes, are progressing quietly and comfortably towards our father's house. And all this is reiterating the lesson that we learnt in Letter 7, that Screwtape is perfectly happy to have fairly unimpressive faults, only as long as it results in the capture of a soul. And his comments here also show the importance of one's friends and the role that they play in getting us to our final destination, be that heaven or hell. So what do you guys think about this section? So I think it's really interesting how he he immediately is get he gets excited about the people that he's around. Uh because he he's these are people that I think in in today's world we would consider oh these are good people. These are good people. There are so many times in my life that I've hung out with people that I thought oh yeah they these are good people, but they're not intentional people. They're not striving for holiness. They're not striving for, to live the art of the virtuous life. Whoever has said that you're the, kind of the, the average of the five people that you surround yourself with, that's kind of a cliche. I know people have all heard that, but I, yeah. it's definitely true. Th- th- we're made for communion. We're made for, you know, to, to be a part of other people's lives and who you surround yourself with reflects not only you, but your family, your, your children, um, I, I just think instantly how excited he was and how he was totally fine with these people who are what I would consider good people in today's world. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it is definitely true what you said about being the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I just know in, in my life, you know, times when I run into buddies from college or something, just even in just a short conversation with them, I find myself very quickly slipping back into old uh, habits of speech. You know, I find myself talking differently and uh saying things it's like i i'm surprised i said that you know but just they kind of had you know that effect on me and it's not there i'm not certainly not blaming them for my bad habits but uh that is something that we have to be aware of because um we're made for communion and just as people um humanity is is made to be with one another um and so you just have a way of becoming more like the people that you're with and making them more like you. I mean, I can tell you my wife tells much, much worse jokes now than she used to, <laughs> you know, and I, I know that's my fault, okay? She spends too much, well, she, I don't think she spends too much time with me. I like that she spends time with me, but it's not been good for her uh, <laughs> sense of humor. And as a supporter of you guys on Patreon, I get to experience your online community, The Council of Man. And I've seen the good that a community, even one that is entirely online, or at least for most of the year, it's entirely online. We get together at the campouts. 
but even that online community, how much good that that can foster. Mm. Yeah, it is good because you can have a productive relationship. I mean, you know, we pray for each other and yeah, it, celebrate it's so, each it, other's joys. And Yeah, it's so cool to see it. You know, a guy is suffering. He, he posts on there, my family member has passed away. And you get 20 people who say, I'm going to adoration for you this weekend. I'm going to Holy yeah. Mass. I'm, I'm praying. My family's praying for you this weekend and for their soul. Like, there's there's comfort there. And it's because we're, again, kind of made for community and we're made right. for, for brotherhood. We kind of lift each other up. You know, in the Proverbs, it says iron sharpens iron. But I think the interesting thing about the iron sharpens iron proverb is that we got to remember that iron only sharpens itself when it comes in contact with itself. It's not that like there's one piece of iron over here and another piece of iron over here and it just like miraculously sharpens each other. Like in order for that to happen, you know, if you take a forge and you're you're hitting metal upon metal and it's sharpening one end, like there, there has to be contact with each other. And so I think that, that that's why it's so important to, to choose your friends who are intentionally striving for holiness, who are intentionally going after the heart of God, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and living, living a virtuous life. Yeah. And I would say it doesn't mean that your friend circle absolutely must be entirely composed of people with exactly the same belief system as you do. No. No. But at the same time, I think the people that are closest to your heart should understand who you are in your worldview intimately yes and that's much easier if you share the same faith yeah yeah the yeah. foundations have to be the same whether or not you you like or dislike certain things is fine like you know david thinks mint chocolate chip ice cream is good which is just ridiculous i don't i, I think it's <laughs> it's objectively wrong but <sighs> bates, uh, you bates you don't like mint chocolate chip it's beautiful it's adam that doesn't like it yeah okay, I think objectively it's you guys are wrong but but <laughs> I'm not basing our foundation on you guys being wrong about mint chocolate chip ice cream. The big things have to be the same. And then as we diverge, like that brings up new concepts and new ideas that, oh, I didn't think about it that way, which is uh, good for, for, you know, our, our souls. Yeah. But I also want to just, you know, say that if you are serious about pursuing uh, what Aristotle calls the good life, um, a life of virtue, then you need to be surrounding yourself with people who are also striving to live a life of virtue. There was a point in my life where I just made a choice that I realized some of my friends from college, um, we were pursuing different things. It's not like I you know, wrote them a letter and said, we are not friends anymore. You suck. Good you day, know? sir. Right, yes. <laughs> I, all the best. Uh, you know, I just chose to start spending time with different people. So you know, there's one thing to have, have friends, but there's another thing to like, who are you really going to invest in? Mm. Um, and some, sometimes the person that you have invested a long, have a long relationship with isn't that guy who is going to be the one to push you in the right direction. I, I mean, that can be a really difficult mm -hmm. thing for a lot of people to do. But we're not here in this. I mean, we're here to serve the Lord. And that always has to be our primary. So, you know, just in the realm of friendship, um, it's something to really, really ponder and pray about. Just put yourself in the book, in the screw tape letters, you know, and what would Wormwood's uncle be saying to him about your friends? We normally say, what would Jesus do? It's what would screw tape say? Yeah. I think we've just concluded with the same advice that St. Paul gave the Corinthians, that bad company corrupts good character. We therefore want good company. Yeah. yeah. He, he did it in like, you know, 10 words and that we did it for it like 10 minutes yeah. so man who knows what he would have done if he had a podcast yeah can you imagine think about the patreon level account yeah. i mean it would just be off the chart but he'd give it all to the church in jerusalem yeah anyway moving on <laughs> uh, from what screw tape says you knew next, what you were getting into david you knew i did you knew about I did. this okay go ahead angling cats i'm sorry from what Wormwood says next, uh, it seems that Wormwood, in his last letter to his uncle, he described this broader group as a group of great laughers. And Screwtape's super suspicious of this description, uh, and he's getting the impression from his nephew that laughter is always in hell's favour. So he therefore devotes the rest of this letter to describing the different types of laughter and which of them can be used for their cause. But before we get onto those, uh, in the episode that you guys did on humor, you spoke about some of the different philosophies of humor. Uh, just give us a 
10, 15 second summary of what some of those philosophies were? You know, there's like a couple basic things that make something funny. One of them is incongruity. Um, you know, the, like good example of this is the picture that everybody has seen of the dogs playing poker. Mm. You know, uh, it's like, it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. Right? Exactly. Like do, dogs <laughs> like, would never bet they, on anything. Dogs like, dogs wouldn't they wouldn't wager. No. You know, I mean, you could get them to sit at a table and put a hat on them, but they're not gonna make a bet. Or it's like you smoke know? a cigar. Right? It's it's incongruous. Right. Okay, uh, that's I think probably the most common. Or uh, another one, the most common is the surprise, the twist. You know, where people think you're going one way, and then all of Boom. a sudden things are not as they have appeared. And it's just people enjoy the uh, the sleight of hand, the unexpectedness of things. Um, yeah, for whatever reason. Yeah, and so I think those things would be funny. Um, and then when you get into like inappropriate jokes, some of those things apply um, often. And this is kind of what he talks about is some people will talk about, joke about sex because they find it incongruous. And then some people will bring up incongruities in order to joke about sex. Mm. And just like the difference in the person, you know, what, what is the end? Yeah. You know, what, what is the purpose, um, the thing that you're striving after in, in this conversation was it, was it when i was reading this i was thinking i wonder which is worse and then it's like well i i guess it would be bringing up incongruities just so you can talk about sex you know like because then that becomes the end you're not really even trying to be funny you're just using it as a means to get to a certain topic well let, let's let's jump into the breakdown that Scutic gives us and i want, I want to pick that up because i think that's i think that's one of the most interesting points that he makes in this chapter Mm -hmm. So the first kind of laughter that Screwtape talks about, he calls it joy. And Lewis readers will know this is a very loaded term for Lewis, but this is how Screwtape describes it. You'll see joy among friends and lovers reunited on the eve of a holiday. Among adults, some pretext in the way of jokes is usually provided, but the facility with which the smallest witticisms produce laughter at such times shows that they are not the real cause. What that real cause is, we do not know. <laughs> and I think it's really worth noting that Screwtape is confused by joy. He doesn't get it. And he doesn't really understand its cause. And he can recognize that there's something disproportionate going on. You know, there's small witticisms producing great laughter. And I wonder, what, what did you guys think is the answer? What is the, the cause of this joy? Well, I would say it's, it's love and charity. And it shows why it's utterly incomprehensible to the demons. Right, right. Because that's exactly what they don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, I might also add that it requires a certain level of humility and self-forgetfulness, which is also something that the demons just don't have. Uh, in the second preface that Lewis wrote for the Screwtape Letters, he says that humor requires a sense of proportion and being able to see yourself from the outside. And he says that's what you absolutely can't have in hell because it's all self-focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and doesn't even talk about uh, music here. Isn't this where he talks about, talks about you know, enjoy, he talk about, talk, mm. talks about music? And I think that's so interesting, right, David? Like, David, I'm interested actually to hear your thoughts on this. I think music is a glimpse of heaven. If scripture is right and much of what we'll be doing for eternity is singing God's praises, I don't think we should be that surprised that here on earth we still catch those moments where we get the, the briefest of visions uh, of what our hearts were made for. Sure. And of course, that's all going to be completely repellent to a demon. Lucifer and his non-serviam, I will not serve. All of that is thoroughly rejected, which is why the demons in Screwtape don't understand music either. All they want is noise. And, you know, chances are there are these angels who sing all the time before the, the throne of our Lord. I would imagine that there are some angels who that was their job who said, I will not serve. And so, like, the one thing that they were supposed to do was sing. And now, in, he in hell, that, they probably just They're scream. the ones who are, like, the result of pop music these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah or death metal. <laughs> anyway. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm pretty sure they were behind the composition of most of Justin Bieber's first album. Yes, yes absolutely. I'm a believer in you, David Bates. 
uh, for people that love Justin Bieber. I'm just, I'm just joking. Just joking. Are you though? Uh, which brings Are us you? on to <laughs> uh, the second type <laughs> of laughter, which is fun. <laughs> and Screw Tape says that it's, it's very closely related to joy, and he describes it as a sort of emotional froth arriving from the play instinct. And he says this kind of laughter isn't very useful to hell. He says it can be used to divert the humans when they should be feeling or doing other things. But he says it's got a whole load of side effects that we don't like. He says it promotes charity, courage, contentment, and many other evils. What do you think he's talking about here? What is the distinction that he's making between joy and fun? So, I mean, I see this all the time in my children. You know, for instance, after Mass, uh, you go to the parish hall or something, and there'll be all these other kids... And they're not doing anything except running in the same direction. You know, there's not like a game. It's just this kind of uh, like they just are going, you know, and they're all kind of going in the same direction and they'll start squealing and laughing. And it's like they don't even know what's going on. They just know like, oh, kids are running that way. I'm running, too. Ah, it's so much fun. (laughs) But, you know, I the same thing happens to me like. If you get into a Corvette and you floor it, then you just get thrown back into your seat. You know, like I'll kind of giggle <laughs> as I'm accelerating. It's just this, ing- you know, like it's a manly thrilling. giggle, though. Right. Oh, it's manly. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> that's my giggle. <laughs> that's it. Uh, it's a real thing. Really? Um, <laughs> okay. But, uh, you know, so it's like, or on a roller coaster, you know, when you right. go over the sure. hill and you drop and it's like, there's, it's kind of a throwback to this same childish, uh, just where the exhilaration is like a physical exhilaration that boils out. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. It, it's funny because when I was reading this, the image that popped into my mind was at the Catholic Man Show camp out when we're passing around the grill gun around <laughs> yes. the campfire. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's it's hard not to not to smile and that laugh. That is another one. It's like when you pull the trigger on that bad Maybe boy, you, <laughs> and you see full grown men just yeah. like giggling. But I mean, you know, so we're made for re- we're made for leisure, right? We're made to rest, and we're made to to enjoy it for for its own end. Uh, but however, he does say that you can use this as a distraction, and I think that that's very important because we can uh, do things. I think we all guilty of like doing things that we want to do because they're fun and this is like appeasing to my appetites and so i wanted to do that uh when we're not when we're supposed to be doing more meaningful things maybe maybe we have other tasks that we're supposed to uh, be accomplishing and so even though it's such a good right it's like the, the good of laughter having fun having leisure time enjoying each other's company is good one of the things screw tape comes back to again and again is that they have to twist good things. They can't make good things themselves. They can't make fresh pleasures. They just have to take good things that God has given us and then twist them. Uh, and so we exploit those pleasures at the wrong way, at the wrong time, or to the wrong degree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Next up, screw tape describes what he calls the joke proper. Laughter from jokes, which he says depends on something that we've just been talking about, which is the sudden perception of incongruity. And Screwtape says that this kind of laughter is much more promising for hell. Uh, Dave, you mentioned it earlier. Rather surprisingly, he says that he's not primarily thinking about indecent or bawdy humor. He says that second-rate tempters, they rely on that sort of thing, and the results are very disappointing. And even in a very rare moment of humility, Screwtape admits that in the early days when he was starting out as a tempter, he tried to rely on that. And he says it's disappointing because primarily people have different relationships to bawdy jokes. As Dave said, you know, some people, they joke about sex because of the incongruities and other people, they cultivate the incongruities because they want to talk about sex. That's kind of shocking in a good Christian book for the author to make that kind of a distinction because it's almost like he's saying that that kind of bawdy humor actually isn't that bad what do you guys think yeah no the first time i read it i definitely had that impression uh you know almost uh, almost a little scandalized you know that he would what no we shouldn't be making those kind of jokes you know i i know from sunday school that you shouldn't make those kind of jokes uh but you know when you 
when you ponder it more, you do, I think, see what he's talking about. Because there, there can, the truth is, there can be funny things about sex. You know, like, there are just the funny things about it. And I think, you know, in the right context, in the right company, um, you certainly would never, ever, ever want to make a joke that would ever um, put your wife in anything other than a good light. But with good friends around you who know you very well, who, know, you know, would never misunderstand what you're doing, I think it can be done. Um, and those jokes can be enjoyed, and I think could even build camaraderie, you know, like they, they can be useful to good ends. But it's very difficult to say what that line is and the exact parameters of that. It, no it is. doubt. It is difficult to say. I, I agree with that. So, because not only have to know yourself in that aspect, but you'd have to know the, your company around you. That's why I said with yeah. you know, people that you know very well. You know. The, the thing that it puts me in mind of is when St. Paul talks about food sacrifice to idols. And he says, it's nothing. But if it troubles the conscience of your fellow believer, for love of that fellow believer, you'll abstain. And so in a same sort of way, I think one of the lessons that I get out of this is to understand that everybody doesn't react to jokes in the same way. In much in the same way when you guys ever talk about alcohol, it's promoting moderation. But for some people, their moderation is none. And so just in a similar way, uh, I, th I think... The lesson for me out of this isn't so much a license to make bawdy jokes, but it, I think it might temper my judgment on my fellow believers when they told a slightly racier joke than I thought was really appropriate. I have a, a kind of a personal history with this. I consider no myself, kidding. yeah, I consider myself to be a funny person. I think a lot of people do. Funny guy. Okay. I'm one of those people. Everybody, you know, like maybe everybody thinks that they're funny. But I really am. That's the thing. <laughs> um, and there was a time, you know, right after college, I'm coming back into the church and taking my faith more seriously. And I did have a moment where I, where I kind of realized I cannot be telling these kinds of jokes. It was very difficult for me to really accept that because one of the, my favorite things about me was my ability to make people laugh. And I, you know... These inappropriate jokes seemed to work more than if I were to tame them a little bit. You know, they're just not as funny. You know, for instance, there's a reason why comedians use the F word all the time. It's got like this extra punch to it. You know, you throw the F word into a joke and people laugh more. It doesn't mean that it is more funny, but uh, you get a stronger effect. So I had to actually Temper? accept the fact that I might not be a funny person anymore. I think the lesson there is actually different. When such things are now out of bounds to you, you have to work harder to be funnier. That's what happens. Because one thing that Screwtape is going to say about flippancy is it's easy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And the cheap a, jokes are easy. That, that is what I found, is that in the moment, you know, that is what the temptation was, is that, well, you're not going to be, you just won't be funny anymore. You won't, people won't, you won't be able to make people laugh. This is your humor, you know, and that was the temptation that was assaulting me. I don't know who I don't know who I am, but I'm not funny anymore. Not a funny guy. And it turned out I still was. <laughs> but it does speak to a self-awareness that you actually, uh, you know, in Christian language, we were talking about, you know, we brought the, you brought the Lord into that. You, you, yeah. you asked this area of my life now that I'm making my faith in Christ a priority. How does that impact this? And even while Screwtape might be saying that ah, it doesn't lead us such good results as we would hope, at least for you, you thought, as you know, I need to change how I'm doing this. This is one of those moments for me where you can look back and see why God allows temptation in our lives. You know, why would God allow uh, Wormwood to afflict one of his beloved children? Well, it's because in the end, he's able to use that to bring us closer to him. You know, that was a, a very powerful moment of surrender for me, where, you know, I was taking maybe one of the, the most beloved character traits that the Lord had given me, and I was essentially like putting it on the altar. I was going to kill it for him. And, you know, as God always is, when you give him something, he always returns it to you in abundance. But still, it was a, it was a very good lesson for me to learn the habit of surrender. 
because jokes can be used by screw tape. And he points out in the letter, one of the most profitable uses for jokes is to destroy shame. And he says that it's particularly effective for one nation, namely the English. Uh, and, he, and he quite accurately says, before we started the show, you said, is this true? It absolutely is true. A deficiency in your sense of humor is probably the worst thing that can ever be said of anybody. And he says, humor is the all consoling and mark this, the all excusing grace of life. Any suggestion that there might be too much of it can be represented to him as puritanical or as betraying a lack of humor. And I think what he's saying here is that jokes can be all excusing. You can dress up cruelty as humor. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say something really nasty and say, just kidding, it was just a joke. Right. You know, if you've read any Jane Austen novel, her nasty characters are always biting. And it's very often presented as a, some form of lighthearted witticism. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that that point he makes in there is 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 just very perfect. I think everybody can relate to it. Right, yeah. It's like, oh, well, if you're taking money from somebody, people are going to say, like, you're a schlup. But if he's like, ha, turn it into a joke, I conned you suckers out of all that money, you know. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, joke's on you. Right, then it's like, oh, that guy, he's... <laughs> I, yeah, he's a, what a kidder. What a, you know, um, all of a sudden it's cool that you did that. You know, I mean, just apply that to anything. If you can make it into a joke, people are just, for some reason, more willing to accept the behavior. Screwtape says the final type of laughter is the best, as far as hell is concerned. Flippancy. Yes. When you guys first read that, what do you think of when somebody talks about being flippant? Because it sounds like something that my mother would say to me. (laughs) And all I generally know is that it's bad. Yeah, I think of uh, pessimism. That's that's what I think of of flippancy. It's just people who are pessimistic and just kind of mock everything. You know, nothing to them is really funny. Or important. um, Except, yeah, or important. The only thing that's funny about it is how other people think that that's good when they know better, you know, that it's... yeah. other people are, you know, inferior because they think... It's the lukewarm guys. It's the guys who are just apathetic to basically everything. It's like, I'm not willing to stand up for anything that is right, nor willing to stand up for anything that is wrong. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the people who are just kind of lukewarm. It, when I read this for the first time, I remember thinking like, man, how many times have I... This is the uh, sins of uh, uh, omission, like the, the things that I have not done. Uh, the things that I failed to do, you know, the, the things that like, oh, well, I just wasn't willing to stand up for this person or I wasn't willing to, you know, stand up for the dignity of this person or willing to swim upstream against the crowd. See, when I think, when I think of flippancy, I also think more of the, the vice of uh, sloth. Um, you, you're unwilling to do the arduous, see, and yeah. so you... Ah, you know, like, that's not really good anyway. There's no reason for me to do that. I'll just not do it. It's like, whatever. Right, yeah, whatever. The definition I came up with was, it's making light of something important and doing it in a disrespectful way. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned earlier, Screwtape thinks this is the best kind of laughter because it doesn't require cleverness. He says, any human can be trained to talk as if virtue were funny. He says, among flippant people, the joke is always assumed to have been made. No one actually makes it, but every serious subject is discussed in a manner which implies that they have already found a ridiculous side to it. And when you first read that, you might think, well, that's actually not too bad. But Screwtape tells us what happens over time once that habit has been established. He says, if prolonged, the habit of flippancy builds up around the man the finest armor plating against the enemy that I know. And it is quite free from the dangers inherent in the other sources of laughter. It is a thousand miles away from joy. It deadens instead of sharpening the intellect. And it excites no affection between those who practice it. Yeah, and I think that someone who, someone who has this vice, the vice of flippancy, if we, you know, if we can call it that, they would also just be repelled by the first, especially the first two types of laughter. The laughter of joy would almost be um, nauseating to them, you know, because they've trained themselves against joy. Yeah. All all things that are good to them, they have trained themselves in order to justify their rejection of it. 
have trained themselves to hate that thing. And so when they encounter something truly good, it unsettles them, which is exactly the armor that I think Screwtape is talking about. Well, yeah, because you don't take virtue seriously. You therefore don't take God seriously. And it's therefore inherently sacrilegious. Right. And it's also prideful because you have to end up looking down on people. When you see people experiencing joy and fun, they have to be subjects of mockery if you're a flippant person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's easy because, as Screwtape says, anyone can be taught to be flippant. It doesn't actually require any cleverness. Right. I mean, it must feel good to do it in the beginning because you, you get to adopt this attitude as if I'm really the smartest person on earth. You know, I'm way up here. Everybody else is just... Yeah. A moron. It, it's filling the pride. Yeah, no doubt. Exactly. You know that type of uh, the gratification that you would get from doing it, it's going to wear off. As as does the gratification of all sin, which makes you have to do it oh, like deeper and deeper. Right, you have to, to get, double yeah, down over and over and over again it. to where you're no longer even caring about anything and you're apathetic to everything. But I think all of this actually takes us full circle back to the idea of a circle of friends, uh-huh. because flippancy is something that you grow in, particularly around your peer group. I mean, honestly, all of this stuff about flippancy goes a long way to describe why teenagers very often are the way they are. Uh, But it is something that you progress in. And as I was reading the section, I thought of Psalm 1, which describes the process or or the degradation of a person who, first of all, walks with sinners, then stands with them, then sits with them. It's, It's kind of like a learned behavior. And one of the ideas that we find again and again in Lewis is this idea that we snowball. Lewis calls it heavenly and hellish creatures. Mm -hmm. That once we begin a habit, when it's nurtured, and particularly when it's nurtured by the community that's around us, it will just just be exacerbated. And so no wonder Screwtape is so happy that this guy is among these friends. Because as long as they're flippant, he will almost certainly become flippant himself. Absolutely. All action that you choose will progress you one way or the other. Even if you think, this is a harmless, this is a harmless thing. I'm allowed to do this. This is good. It's fine. You know, it's just something that I do, you know? Well, this book is exactly why that's not true, because anything you do can be used against you. You know, anything you say can be used against you in the court of hell. (laughs) Um, So... You know, it's just something that we need to be very conscious of and live lives on purpose. If you're going to do something, well, choose to do it. Don't just like, well, I guess I'll do it. You know, as if you're just living out your life, waiting for it to get by, you know, choose the good and, you know, make a choice. Is that really the thing to do? Or, you know, is there something better you can be do? You could be doing, I mean, it might be hard, but uh, life's tough. Get a helmet. Embrace it. Don't be a log. Be a salmon. Yes. yes. Love salmon. And I think that takes us very neatly into screw tape unscrewed. So when we read these letters, we're dealing with screw tape's upside down world, his twisted logic. And so in this section of the episode, we untwist all of that into some do's and don'ts, some suggestions for the person who's fighting at screw tape. Have you got any that you would suggest to the listeners from this letter? Don't listen to a lot of stand up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that you have to take an evaluation of who you're surround, surrounding yourself with. Yeah, and you know, I would just say in the when you like kind of look at your own friends, as a being a good friend might be encouraging them in a good way. You know, if they if you have a friend who likes to make jokes or who likes to use a certain kind of language, I mean, just tell them, you know, like, hey, you know, that's that's really not very funny. And you can kind of say it with a smile on your face, you know. It's not like you're putting them in timeout. Uh, encourage them. Dude, what if you could in, put friends in timeout like you do your children or something like <laughs> How epic would that? You know what, dude? You know what? That was stupid. Go to timeout. Right. That would yeah, actually, be... you, you know what? You could take a note from it. And it's like, if you do that as a joke, it might work. It may work, yeah. That would be if awesome, If you do it though. serious, like, dude, I want you to go sit in timeout. Yeah, that was like, stupid. Though, Don't do that. That would be weird. But if you're like, hey, that was a bad joke, and you know it. And you're going to sit in time out. That is it's so weird how if you make a joke about something, people just go along with it. But, I mean, it's not good for you to be around bad jokes, and it's especially not good for them to be making them. Important to ha- do it with tact 
and with joy and charity. Um, and humor. And humor, of course, yeah. And also take into account what you, what you have to say. Because like in our final judgment, we're going to be uh, you know, judged for what we have said and what we have failed to say. Yeah. And so uh, I think that goes back into our laughter. Are we getting cheap tricks? You know, are we getting cheap laughters? Are we saying something that's crude and inappropriate just so that way people will like me? Like, I'm going to be judged for all those times that I have said crude and inappropriate jokes or belittled people or like, you know, yeah. demeaned their dignity or, you know, whatever it is just for a cheap laugh. Your friends should know what kind of person you are, and they should know that, you know, David doesn't want to hear that kind of joke. I shouldn't make that around him. I shouldn't talk that way around him, because that's not the kind of man he is. And when your friends know that about you, then they will become better friends around you, and, you know, it, it's just, everything's going to be better. It'll be the opposite of what we see taking place in chapter 11, 10 and 11, where uh, the patient meets these other friends. You can be the antidote to the friends like that. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing that for your friends, then there's no point in your friendship. It's rather like Jack Nicholson in As Good As It Gets. You make me want to be a better man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How exactly. many of your friends can say that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think we pretty much covered all of the do's and don'ts. Uh, I, I, just, I describe them this way. Do not be flippant. Pay attention to those who are influencing you. Do build a supportive community. Celebrate joy. Have fun. Make jokes. But be careful. Guys, thank you so much for being my guest co-hosts today. To close things out, can you please tell us another joke or two and then explain where they can go to find out more about the Catholic Man Show? So my wife, she gets really mad at me because the other day, she, you know, she like kind of had the, enough because I'm just so bad with directions. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to pack my stuff and write. That was, that was terrible. That was so terrible. I said it, I said it wrong, too, because I, I said it in present tense. I needed to say it in yeah, past tense. I had tense. to say it in past tense. <laughs> so I packed my stuff yeah, and left. And, and I was right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a dad joke. <laughs> that, that is, is a dad joke. <laughs> you, have to, you have to own That's up to the, the dad perfect joke. perfect dad yeah. joke because you tried to tell Do it. And you David, messed it up. Do not edit that out. Do not do oh, no. that. That's it. I mean, that's, that's it. it. I clearly did that on purpose. Yeah, I mean, naturally. Ironically. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. It's layers. Yeah, it's that's, a layered joke. You're I'm, welcome, audience. I operate. It's deep. Yeah. You know? Well, I have two for you. What did the beach say when the tide came in? Long time no see. Uh, long, long time no see. I was going to say, I wave back. Okay. That, that would have been good. But do you know how to cut a wave in half? You use a seesaw. <laughs> <laughs> so if people want similar sorts of quality of jokes, how do they listen to The Catholic Man Show? <laughs> so we have a MySpace page. If you go to myspace.com slash The Catholic Man Show, you will find actually... Actually, I think, I, I, think I did actually make a My, MySpace page. Can we all agree that we regret not, not standing up for Tom? Like, Tom was our friend. Whatever, Tom, Tom's in, he's super he's, rich. He's super rich, but he was our friend, and we just neglected him for Facebook. Look, he never even changed his profile picture. <laughs> his top eight were not, were, never right. were changed. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. No, so you can go to thecatholicmanshow.com, any podcast that, that you uh, enjoy, you can probably look it up. You did make a MySpace page. I just I, I knew I knew that I did actually make my a I MySpace. just went to it. I just do that. I did that. I went to myspace.com slash the Catholic Man Show. And it is we do actually have a MySpace page. <laughs> follow us there. <laughs> Go follow us. <laughs> <laughs> See, everybody's leaving Twitter to go to Parlor. Maybe people will maybe leave should, Facebook maybe, to like, go maybe, back to MySpace. Maybe we should go back everybody's to MySpace. going to like new things. No, guys. No, we no. need to go back to the yeah. source. Yes. MySpace. Anyway, David, thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Um, it's been a lot of fun. It has indeed. I've learned some truly terrible jokes. And listeners, please check out the Pints of Jack store. There's still time to order a laser etch glass or a t-shirt for a Christmas present. And as always, thanks to our top tier supporters, Jeff, Chris, John, Kate, and Rowdy. And join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. 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 Cheers.